I'm Petty Jean Sheldon. I'm a uh, district leader for the South, South Atlantic um, <laughs> District. Uh, I'm also on the Membership Engagement Council, and I uh, live and, and practice in the Athens area of Georgia. Go dogs! And um, I'm very pleased to be presenting uh, leadership uh, skills, conflict resolution, and um, I, I am going to zip through this, but I tailored this for chapter leadership persons because I know all of us deal with conflict every day. And if we're not dealing with it with our team, we may be dealing with it from our referral sources, and we certainly are dealing it with our, as I call it, the Jerry Springer families we have to deal with sometimes, so, or our patients. So let's just uh, look at this. I'm gonna explain the difference between a group and a team. I'm gonna discuss the leadership role, talk about the five stages of team development, which I think will be very helpful for you with your chapters, define conflict, and discover uh, techniques. So what's the difference between a group and a team? And I, a group has a common purpose, um, but the individuals are more oriented to their own achievements, success, and rewards. And when we look at teams, they're working towards a common goal. The team is working towards success and um, there's a lot of collaboration. And a really good example of this, because we can get really crazy with a, what's a group versus a team, is when all of us get in the elevator in a little bit to go upstairs to our room, we're a group. But if that elevator gets stuck, <laughs> now we're a team. <laughs> Y'all with me? Okay. Changes that fast. So some of the leadership things, one of the things you should do is know yourself and take care of yourself. Uh, one of the things I think about is I learned a valuable lesson uh, a while back that I need to make sure I eat something in the morning before I go to meetings. Because what is it the young people say today? Is it hung angry? <laughs> hey, thank you. You know, I, I was real irritable and I was like, what's the matter with me? So I got a little something to eat and I realized that's so when you have meetings, what's the lesson learned? Bring food, bring chocolate. Um, it's important to clarify your own personal needs and, and what are the needs of your team. Identify a safe place for negotiation. One of the lessons I've learned, and I use it all the time, is that you praise in public and you criticize in private. So if you're gonna have to have a discussion where there's uh, maybe going to be some elevated emotions and what have you. Let's not do that in the middle of the nurse's station or in the person's home or what have you. Let's find a good place to have a negotiation. Um, take a listening stance. I think one of the hallmarks of maturity is when we realize that whatever our views are, we can take a step back and really listen to what the other person has to say. But if you're... Um, one of the, the uh, hallmarks of not really listening what the other person is saying is you're interrupting and you've already got a response as soon as they finish talking. You're really not listening. Your mind's already coming up with a response and you really haven't stopped to listen to what they say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And my allergy medicine just kicked in. Um, assert your needs uh, clearly and specifically. Um, approach problem solving with flexibility. And I think this is um, very important within your chapter. Um, be willing to be flexible. It doesn't have to be your way or the highway. Um, think about, you know, it might work that way. So give it a chance. Um, manage impasse with calm and patience and respect. And sometimes what you'll need to do if you're having a discussion maybe with your board at a chapter meeting and there's some conflict is table it and bring it back up at the next meeting, which will give everybody a chance to kind of explore their feelings and what's really important to them and why is there opposition. Um, and build an agreement that works. I like to use Tuckman's Five stages, I learned about this back in the 90s. It can't, Tuckman um, published this back in 1965, I think. Is anybody here familiar with Tuckman's stages of how teams form? And they've just added this fifth stage, which is a journey. 
So if you think about your chapter and your board of directors um, on your chapter, it's forming, storming, norming, performing, and then a journey. But hopefully your chapters won't be a journey. Don't want to hear about that. So with forming, the team is positive and polite. You think about when you get invited to be on a, a team, you're all excited. They ask you to, to join. And um, the leader, uh, when you're uh, in the forming stage, the leader has a lot uh, to do with that role. And you're going to be dominant. And you're going to be doing a lot of uh, preparatory work for your meetings. The, the leader's going to be directing. You're going to keep everybody on the agenda. What's, what's the goal for the meeting today? And it's going to be your job to keep everybody on task. Establish clear objectives for the team as a whole and for the individuals. I think back to when we started um, the chapter in Athens and one of the things we were concerned about, there was over 20 hospice providers. And we had heard horror stories about competition and chapters disbanding because of competition. So we sat down and talked about that, had an open discussion, and agreed that we, we were about the community, not our employers. And we were about patients and their families, not our employers. And we were going to park our badges at the door. And we've had to revisit that discussion occasionally. But I think by putting those things out at, at the very beginning has helped us keep that um, subject not something that we're dealing with. We have other issues to deal with, but not that one in particular. This stage can last quite a while. The storming stage, this is where you as a leader uh, within your chapter will have to have some skills with helping with conflict. Um, this is where uh, members of your team are going to start pushing boundaries, uh, questioning processes. It's going to be important that we start building trust and good relationships, resolve those conflicts swiftly, remain positive. Sometimes um, it's helpful to present the five stages of Tuckman's team development so that your team understands where they are, what stage, and that they're reflecting the stage ap appropriate to what's going on. They're like, hey, y'all, I think we're, we're, is this a storming stage I'm seeing here today? So in this stage um, is often where teams fail, or you think about your chapters. If there's conflict and you can't get it resolved and you can't move through this stage, what happens? your chapter disbands. So this is where, this is where you do your um, real uh, important work. Norming the team moves to resolve differences and appreciate each other's strengths. And this is a, a good time for a team building event. Um, if you do a retreat or you start your meeting with some time of a team building exercise. This is a good time. As you start seeing your team move from storming into norming, this would be a good time to do that. You also may see that your team uh, starts socializing. Maybe some of your officers will say, hey, anybody hungry? Let's go out to dinner after the meeting. So that helps you as a leader see that your team is moving through these stages. Uh, your team members are going to ask for help and feedback. Um, you know, you might say like, Lola, you do a great job with the flyers for our chapter. Would you keep doing that? You just, you're great at that. So uh, the team can demonstrate a stronger commitment to the goal and the leader can start pedaling back. Uh, storming and norming may overlap as a new task comes up. For instance, if you're going to do a weekend retreat or a Saturday conference, you may start seeing some storming because this is something new for your team. So as a leader, be prepared for that. Then your, your team will move into performing. They work towards the achievement of goals. You've got structures and process in place. Uh, the leader can start delegating tasks. Uh, you can start working on developing the other members in your chapter. Um, buddy system, start bringing somebody in who you think could take your place when you move on. So um, these are things you can be thinking about. And often new members joining the team can cause some disruption or little disruption. It's how the team is perceiving bringing people in. Are they welcoming of new members? And I often frame it with if you ever hope to rotate off, you have to bring a replacement. So we all have to be very, very helpful and glad to see new people join our group. 
Adjourning is when the team can celebrate their achievements. You can plan a retreat or a dinner out uh, and recruit new leadership members. So that's, I'm all about partying. So some uh, leadership activities during these different stages. Am I going too fast? Okay. Uh, forming, ooh, I should have increased that font. Ooh, the leader needs, during the forming stage, you need to be directive, consistent, and organized. You'll do a lot of preparatory work before your meetings. Uh, review the mission, the goals, the values, not only for HPNA as an organization, but what, what is it your chapter is trying to accomplish. Uh, engage and encourage. Ask, Susan, I, I, what, what do you think about doing this? Um, share relevant information. Ask the team members to share their stories. Why are they interested in serving on a, on a, a board in a chapter? Or why are they coming? And one of the things you might want to um, take a look at is Lessons from Geese, Breakthrough Line of One. It's on YouTube, so if you just write that title down, you can YouTube it and show it to your group. I'm sure you've all read the philosophy, if you will, about geese and why they honk and why there's one in the lead and when one gets sick and drops out to go down with it, two geese. So this uh, YouTube uh, presentation, it's just a couple of minutes, but it's very inspiring about how important it is for us to support one another. And our honking should be in a positive honk. <laughs> Storming, be prepared. The leader needs to be watching for this. Be attentive. Monitor for conflict during brainstorming and idea generation sessions. This is where some of your conflict may come up. Uh, be prepared for it. Acknowledge conflict. One of the exercises I put myself through is what are some of the things people are going to bring up why they don't like this idea? So if I'm thinking, I already thought that through, then as the group start, the team starts talking about it, I've already done some thinking about that. Acknowledge the conflict. How is your team gonna respond? And avoid, uh, avoid unhealthy ways of dealing with it. And you know your team is not dealing well when you have the meeting after the meeting. Mm -hmm. Your team members are out in the parking lot talking, gossiping, backstabbing, backbiting, there's mistrust. So if you see these behaviors, you know you need to do some team development. Norming, you can begin delegating. And, and um, I'm a recovering type A, <laughs> um, which means I try to restrict myself to punching the elevator button only twice. Um, but if you ever hope to lessen your load, you've got to be comfortable with delegating, okay? And you have to be comfortable with um, being open to coach and mentor whoever's taking that task. They may not do it perfectly the way you're doing it, but my feeling is if you're gonna get that upset because they're not doing it your way, then you need to take the task back. Y'all with me? Okay, um, help maintain the morale and motivation and acknowledge uh, relationships and opportunities. When your team gets to performing in a journey, the leader's role is to be participative. Your team has become skilled and competent. So you might look for areas that you can work with your team members for growth um, at this stage and consider expanding the team's comfort level. For instance, like Lola's chapter did that um, Saturday conference um, for the community, and that that I know that was that was challenging to her group. So consider some of those things that are different for your chapter to do. So some um, resolution tips. I love this: rock, paper, scissors. Can't we all just get along? So one of the things to do if conflict rears its ugly head, and we know it's going to, is um, step back and slow down. Um, you may not get your agenda done like you thought. That's okay. So just step back. Be clear about your intentions and the goals for the conversation. You may have to uh, get the group back on task. 
I know you all know these things. Listen first to understand and ask questions to explore the other person's story about what they're trying to tell. And I think that's, that's so huge because we're not listening if we're not asking questions about, well, why do you think we should offer it on Thursday, Friday instead of Friday, Saturday? Why do you think that would be more successful? So you need to ask questions and interview the person who's in opposition to you. Ask them questions so that you can hear what they're trying to say. They may not be as articulate or saying all the information that would help you maybe change your mind. So um, listen first to their story. Express strong feelings without blame. The, the I statements, and I gave you a handout with a bunch of I statements on it um, that I think is really helpful. And one of the lessons I learned a long time ago was that um, when people do things differently from us, we often say wrong. How many of us feel the Brits drive on the wrong side of the street? You with me? How many of you have spouses that do things wrong? It's not wrong, they just do things differently. And we need to rethink what we're saying. Our words, our communication is so important. So it's not that they're wrong, it's just different. So step back and ask yourself, is it really wrong or is this just different? And if it's different, is my way really any better than somebody else's way? So you need to ask that. And then I just gave you a little bit about some different behaviors. People who are assertive use the I statement. Aggressive uh, folks will use the you. You never get your things done. Passive, what does a passive person do? Anybody work with people that are passive? They don't say anything. Except sometimes they might be in the parking lot, the meeting after the meeting. But um, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. But little is said, they're not supporting either side. Um, assertive people are willing to compromise and say they're sorry. Um, aggressive people, when there's this kind of conflict, nothing's getting solved. And passive people participate and nothing's getting solved. They also often give in. Assertive people are looking for the bre uh, best way to come to resolution. Uh, aggressive folks, it's their way or the highway. They're pushing their own agenda, which you may not know what that is. Uh, and the passive person never sticks up for themselves. The assertive person admits mistakes. The uh, aggressive person has a I'm right, you're wrong attitude. Passive person just frustrates the rest of us. Um, the assertive person is curious about the other person's ideas, the curious about the other person's um, suggestions or recommendations. Um, the aggressive person is not listening to what you have to say. They're already forming a response to what you're saying, so you can't do both those things at the same time. Uh, assertive people are curious about others. Uh, I guess I just said that. The uh, assertive person believes in a win-win. Uh, assertive, aggressive person's um, not very flexible. Assertive people intentionally listen, um, and they can change their minds if needed. The aggressive person creates a competitive um, atmosphere. The assertive person believes in teamwork and they inspire their team. The aggressive person discourages, discourages the team. We've all been on committees and teams like that, correct? Yeah, our bosses like that, yeah. Beware of how your own self-image might make you more defensive. What is it about your personality and your experiences that makes you want to say, my way or the highway? Take responsibility for your assumptions. <laughs> I have this in my office. To save time, let's just assume I know everything. Let's just move on from there. Find common ground. And sometimes as a leader within your chapter, you, and you may not be the president, you may be the program chair, but you may be helping two people that ha are having conflict to, to see the common ground. And you might be um, piping up to say, well, I heard Lola say 
this and Lynn is saying that and I'm, I'm hearing that both of you are saying that these are the, the good things that we ought to be doing. Am I hearing correctly? Am I sensing it right? So th that can often help diffuse conflict. Explore what is most important to the other person. How are you going to know what's more important to the other person? You have to ask them. And how many times at meetings um, would, have you ever found yourself saying, I have strong feelings about this? Or you may say, I don't have strong feelings about this. Whichever way you all want to do it is fine with me. Or I have strong feelings about this because. So that's a good way to handle um, addressing your feelings uh, about an issue. Let go of the myths about conflict. Conflict often is a very good thing. Why, why do you think it's a good thing? Anybody? It can bring people together after it's over. True. What else? Yes. Yes, very good. Did you all hear her all right? Okay. Lynn? I was just going to say, critical thinking skills, you've got to open yourself up mm -hmm. and really consider what somebody else may be offering. Think outside the box. They may be better at it. And I think um, that's a huge um, growth step for all of us when we can do that. If you're trying to get buy-in with your team, your team's not going to come to you with ideas. If every time they bring an idea, you're shutting the door on them. So it's real important that you see conflict as a positive thing, as a way to uh, grow your team. Remember the four principal approaches to conflict. And I gave you all a handout with the, the little key points. Um, but change can be a good thing. Just don't make me do it. I'm, I'm fine with you doing it, but I don't want to change. Some things to think about when you're initiating a com uh, conversation about conflict. There, some hints are on your handout. Anybody else have any other hints other than the ones on the handout? The hand up that looks like this, I'm going to borrow yours. Does anybody have any different ones? Check yourself. Have you eaten? <laughs> Are you tired? Is there something else going on? Maybe today's not a good day to discuss this. Um, do you not have a trusting relationship with that person? Maybe you disrespect that person? How do you listen to somebody that you don't have respect for or don't trust? How well are you, Lilith? Yeah, I'm seeing you all smile go, yeah. How, how well are you really having a conversation with that person? How well are you really trying to strive to resolve conflict? Well, it's hard. I mean, it is very hard. If you don't trust them, it's because it generally because there's a reason mm -hmm. they let you down. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it's not the same of trying to listen to a patient. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're the engineer or whatever. It's someone, you know, that's... I was wondering about adding to that, um, or, or maybe, it, maybe it's embedded in one of these, but um, a lot of times I think conflict comes um, when we don't feel heard. Um, so if I'm saying something, I, if, I, if I'm trying to check myself if I feel the need to say it again, um, what is that in me? Because someone didn't acknowledge that they hurt me, um, and why do I need that? And so, if someone else is doing that, and I'm the leader of the of the discussion or whatever, how can I make sure that they know that I hurt them? Um, whether we address it and talk about it right then or offline, but at least letting them know that that their thoughts are valuable and they've been heard, even if we don't all agree. I think that's very important and as a leader, whether you have an official title or not, it's just to me part of being a leader. And again, you may be the secretary of your chapter, but you may have the skill and you're comfortable. And I liked what Connie said earlier today, um, I think, no, or was it uh, Brenda about Oprah says, I see, I hear, and what you have to say is important to me. So what happens when the person you're interacting with is not seeing or hearing? and acknowledging what you have to say. Well, I think it's time, then, then I think it's, depending on who it is in your relationship, is to say, you know, I feel like you're not hearing what I'm saying. Because when I see a person 
echoing what they've said over and over again, that's a sign that the other person's not listening. And that may be a time to take a break and, and table the subject for now. Um, because for whatever reason, the other person's got an agenda, has got an issue, and they're not listening to what you have to say. So it may be time to take a break and just table it, if you can, if you can do that. I think that works on both ends of it because sometimes I think we end up in situations and we haven't had breakfast or we're thinking we right. need to do right. other things and trying to acknowledge that this is important to you but this isn't the quick the best time or I can't do that. You don't have my full attention right now. So right. Point. right. And then the reverse is if you're trying to make your point and you're not getting that to again say, you know, it looks like you don't have time to discuss this issue mm -hmm. when I get out there. Exactly. Um, exactly. And I found that because then I can prepare myself. And sometimes you know you have people coming in and like they are not prepared to deal with this right now, but I do value being right. And that's that's uh, a good point because I. I see myself using these skills when I was dealing with children at home. I just was in a place I couldn't hear what they had to say right that minute. So I'd negotiate a time where we would sit down and talk. Um, or at work, I'm right in the middle of doing four things and you're talking to me about the fifth thing and I really can't hear you right now. And I um, have a colleague who talks to me while I'm on my computer and I've had to say to her, if you're really talking to me about something that needs my full attention, you need to make sure I'm looking at you because if I'm looking at my computer, I'm doing, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, and I haven't heard a word you've said. So we have this negotiated out with us that she knows I'm really not listening unless I turn and look at her and get away from my computer because I'm tasking, I'm trying to get things done, and we all do that, but I know myself enough and I'm comfortable enough with myself to have her call me on it to say, you're not looking at me, are you sure you're hearing what I'm saying? No, I'm not. So let me turn around so I can look at you and hear what you're saying. And part of that's so. knowing yourself. Yeah, you know, because, exactly. Um, like before my team meetings at my, my job, you know, that's when all the staff's coming in. So they're like, Amy, this, Amy. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm trying to get the meeting started. Mm -hmm. I've got the agenda. I'm trying to get the IT going. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, yeah, I know I'm seeing you in person, but mm -hmm. I want to value, you know, validate I, that this is mm -hmm. important. But please don't come to me with something important at that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I have to know that in myself that I, I just can't handle it. And, I might, and then I'm going to end up being stressed because mm -hmm. I want to be more. Mm -hmm. So see, you all, none of you need this class. You all ha know all these things. Go ahead. I think when you know yourself too and you've done it enough times to do that. <laughs> because exactly. when you're tired and hungry and stressed, these mm -hmm. are sometimes the first thing that goes out the door that you don't remember until mm -hmm. afterwards. And then mm -hmm. you feel bad. You hurt somebody's feelings mm -hmm. or they're, you know, quiet or you know you you feel like you've screwed up and then you start you, you learn from that but you, I mean this isn't something we all grew up knowing or we, right. we automatically do these things we usually bundled um, mm -hmm. to do these right right it's that thoughtful intention yeah. taking a step back and really thinking about what it is that you're intending to do and are you prepared mm -hmm. um, and I'm like you I have stuck my foot in it so many times um, and I've, I've learned the hard way um, because that's just how I like to learn things, but um, <laughs> apparently. But um, you do save yourself a whole lot more time and the processes and um, tasks that you're trying to get accomplished do go better and smoother when you really know yourself mm -hmm. and know how to handle some of these things. Be open to learning new information. I think that's uh, really important. How many of you have worked with uh, folks that tell you the old, well, we've always done it that way? Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many new things happening. I mean, Connie's last session, I didn't realize there were so many different ways of saying physician-assisted death. Um, so there's, there's so many new things out there that we have to be open to new information and new ways of doing things. Who would have thought um, about trying to have a chapter meeting in three different locations and broadcasting it. Well, you can do that today. And I was joking with um, Chad and Jessica uh, here at HPNA that I was bringing my presentation on Jump Drive, but I also wanted them to have it because I don't trust all this technology stuff. And whatever happened to transparencies and blackboards? <laughs> Because that's just who I am. So, you know, there's so many new ways of doing things that we need to be open to hearing about those new ways. 
any of you have any questions, comments? Yes. So one of the things you were talking about were like team building exercises. Mm -hmm. Do you have any that you suggest or resources for anything like that? Um, two that are on the top of my head, just a fun, fun one. If you find that your team tends to separate into two different groups. Mm -hmm. Let's just say for today's example, all the palliative care people sit together and all the hospice people sit together. So one of the things you might do is think of famous pairs like salt and pepper, bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. um, Sonny and Cher, and put, uh, put the names of the labels on labels and put the labels on people's back and so the team building exercise is they have to ask questions to find out what might be their label. Then they have to go find their pair. It's just a team builder. The other one that works successfully is um, asking three questions, things you, uh, you may not know about somebody. So they have to tell you three things they don't know about, that you don't know about them. And that's a real, uh, good team building exercise. So you, let me just make sure I'm saying it correctly. Ask them to tell you three things they don't already know about you. And then once you exchange those um, three things, say something about what you admire about them. And then they should tell you something they admire about you. That's a great team building um, exercise too. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. One of the things we talked about for active listening was to get a partner. And were you there? Is no, uh-uh. Right. And this is very hard to do, to learn how to active listen. You face each other, and one of you shuts up. You don't say anything. And you allow the other person with a little buzzer five minutes to talk about themselves, like a loss or something. Mm -hmm. And you can't say anything. And you have to listen to what they're saying. And you have to, in order to be able to listen to someone, you have to be able to engage them so you're look, looking at them. And so that's actually a team building, but it also works for active listening for someone to listen. Because five minutes is a long time to have to sit there and not say nothing. It, it's true, and, and the uh, part of giving feedback to what they heard, and they also, since more than 80% of our communication is nonverbal. That's, that's often an exercise we do for train the trainer, um, is how is the listener letting the speaker know they're listening to you? Are they nodding? Are they making sounds? Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Um, patting you? Mm-hmm. So, you become very aware of that mm -hmm. as the person who's not able to speak. You're like, uh, you're kind of so you become aware of those, those, yes. those you know, body language. Yes, yeah, very it much really, so. It's an interesting one, and especially with conflict resolution, mm -hmm. if you practice that beforehand, you I've done that with a nonviolent communication class, and this was even harder, was after that person told you for five minutes, you had to say back to them word what they word. had said for five minutes. Word for word. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. And you really want to do conflict yeah. resolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Put two people mm -hmm. next to each other. Mm -hmm. One person gets, they can use a signal. It's the timeout signal. The other person, they can say. And it's funny, because people think they can just listen to a whole bunch mm -hmm. and then regurgitate what you said. Mm -hmm. But like you've been saying, we only listen to reply. We don't listen to what the person's mm -hmm. actually saying. Mm -hmm. And if you, if it's a high emotional situation, put two people together, and the other person has to repeat it. Mm -hmm. You can only get about five or six words in, but your the fighting goes down because one, you have to think about what you're saying, what's coming out of your mouth, mm -hmm. and you get to hear it coming back. Right. Mm -hmm. And I often use the I the I statements are helpful, and I often use the statement I sense. I have a sense that um, the two of you have been arguing, or I have a sense that. Um, uh, I'm not, I haven't been listening as closely as I could. You know, it, it takes a big person, and I am a big person. It takes a big person to step back and own the problem. But I have found that it's a whole lot easier to own the problem than to keep trying to win, win the war. Um, when I own the problem, then we can come to resolution a whole lot quicker.
And I, it may not be my problem. I need you to hear me say, I'm not being passive. But if I just say, I, I feel like I haven't been doing as much as I should, uh, what is it I could do to help this situation? When you own it, there's something about getting through it to having some uh, a, a win-win type resolution. And that takes a big person because a lot of us don't want to don't do that. Um, and I spent many years not wanting to do that. But I have found it's very encouraging and very positive to do that and, and then have a good resolution come out of it. So it's very rewarding once you start doing that. Uh, you find, well, gee, that's not so hard to do it that way. Yeah, I went to a conference, I'm learning nursing and something else, but one thing too is that if you're in a, a heating, not a heating conversation, but the person is getting very upset, yawn. Mm -hmm. The reason being is that if they yawn, they see you yawn, they're going to yawn. Then they body, your body automatically starts relaxing because of oxygen. And so you start yawning. If you yawn, it makes them stop. <laughs> and then they start kind of backing down on it. It was not like Or they can say something like, what am I talking about? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, um, I don't know, I don't know about that. There, I think there are some personalities that would, that would fuel their anger. Um, do, do these tips help you all with how you might uh, uh, work within your chapter? And I just want to remind you, there are things you're doing every single day in your profession or at home. You're handling these types of things all the time. That's why I was, I was glad to do this because I really felt like I was preaching to the choir because you do these things all the time. Sometimes we just have to use those skills in places we didn't think we were going to have to use them. So, um, any other comments or I mean, questions? I mean, this was really valuable, but just to transition into mm -hmm. the home, I don't know if people who are in the home are, are seeing more and more conflicts. It just seems mm -hmm. from when I started in hospice years ago to mm -hmm. now, just, it seems to be almost a weekly mm -hmm. occurrence in some um, patients' families mm -hmm. who are having a lot more conflicts. Okay, them. thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Yes, California. No, and I, I, I'm, I'm a palliative care coordinator in a, in a hospital, and so I, I'm not seeing it in the home, but we're seeing more and more families with conflict um, that, that don't get along, and, um, you know, I often say the patient's only going to be here three days, so we, there's not a whole lot we can change about this. Let's just do what the Let's make sure we're doing what the patient wants. That's who we're here to serve. So, but I have noticed it seems there's more tension and stress with families. And um, I've noticed too that there's a lot less nuclear families, that the kids are, you know, mom and dad are in Athens and the family, the kids are spread out all over this, the nation. And it's very hard to coordinate and do things and their personalities rise up. And um, so, and, and, uh, we have a term, you know, the one child, is, adult child is, has stayed in the hometown and is taking care of mom and dad, mm -hmm. and they're doing a great job, you know, hero's job of taking care of mom and dad. And dad's in the hospital. So we've told the daughter, you better call your brothers and sisters. So, and it's always from California, so I'm just yeah. going to say this. <laughs> Sorry. The, the sibling from California comes criticizes the sibling who's been doing all the work 24-7. Exactly. Well, you should have asked the doctors this. And then they get on their plane and go back to California. And we call them seagulls because they fly in all over the place and then fly out. So, well, if they're from California, we just... We'll be having a, a, a meeting with a patient and, and family, and the patient may say, well, I have a son in California, so the team's going, you know, <laughs> really? So, um, and it's, that's, 
irreverent, but that's part of us being able to self-care. We have to have a little humor. And if we're having one of our uh, rounds, I might say, this family's got a seagull. Everybody knows what that means. I love that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I would love to, I was enjoying the conversation that, or the, the brainstorming around team building activities um, mm -hmm. with the executive board. Um, we, we did a little leadership retreat and you know so I, and I've been searching online um, I'll share what we did that actually ended up being Please. effective but then I'd love to know more more ideas because I think everybody does that kind of thing and then what the goal of those is mm -hmm. is it is it just to get people to know each other better mm -hmm. or is it I guess sometimes maybe it's to get them thinking about how to work together on something the mm -hmm. one we did was just a kind of get to know each other in a group setting we had everybody go around and share two truths and a lie and then we came back. You that, know, that's a fun them. one too. And then we came back and said, "Now, which one was it?" People guessed based on what they knew about mm -hmm. the person, but it was mm -hmm. fun because it was over dinner, um, and so we learned a lot about one another through that because there was stories involved in what was really mm -hmm. true and what wasn't, mm -hmm. and so it allowed people to share more than just statements. Mm -hmm. um, and we've we've re that was our first social thing, and then the next executive meeting we actually had it at my house, and I provided wine, and mm -hmm. you know, it, oh, it, wine, that's good. Well, yeah, yeah, the chapter didn't pay for that, but you know, but I mean. I've seen a transition in our executive boards where we actually mm -hmm. kind of are just enjoying being with one another. Mm -hmm. and here's our third year of being a chapter. And it's, it's, it's a change, so I see how that was helpful, but I'd love ideas on other things to do. There are lots of resources if you um, Google it. Yeah. I, I still like to touch books, but if you'll Google it, there's there's just so many different ones. And I like that one of the ones in my presentation I refer to is, you know, you may not want to do everybody at one of your executive meetings but choose one or two people to talk about their story what brought them to hospice or what brought them to palliative care or wh where's their passion like Connie gave you some great questions today that we were all self-searching the answers for but those questions would be great icebreakers for your team to ask your team those same questions don't you think yeah. no no that, that, uh, in fact a lot of interviews I'll ask Mm -hmm. What's your hospice story? Because mm -hmm. everybody has some mm -hmm. type of story, mm -hmm. and you really kind of it puts people at ease, and they can kind of sh you get a good sense what's their passion, mm -hmm. what, what drew them to this field. So. Well, thank you all for your attention. Appreciate your attendance. Thank you.